dat het misgaat met ons klimaat, signaleren wetenschappers al decennia. Opvallend veel plekken in de wereld hebben op dit moment te maken met extreem weer. Oktober was niet alleen de warmste, maar ook de natste maand ooit gemeten door het KNMI. Maar kunnen wetenschappers het tij ook keren? Wat we trying to do here is to feed clouds and make them brighter. En moeten we dat wel willen? It distracts us, it delays what we need to do. Climate engineering, een duivels dilemma. It is not, it is not an alternative to emissions reduction. We gaan naar Cambridge, naar het Center for Climate Repair. En dat is dus een plek waar ze echt nadenken om aan het klimaat te sluiten. Ik ben er, bij een van de oudste en bekendste universiteiten ter wereld. Good morning. Good morning, Petra. <laughs> Hi, Sean. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Very good. It's lovely to see you. Good morning. You. So where are we going? We're going to go to the Department of Engineering, which is a short walk from here. What you are actually doing, you're trying to reverse the climate change. Well, strictly speaking, what we are trying to do at the Centre for Climate Repair is at least buy us time to get greenhouse gas levels down. And our concern is that we're going to lose um, glaciers on Greenland. We're going to lose glaciers in, in Antarctica. We're going to lose sea ice. And the consequences of that are ze zijn onimaginable. Ze zijn terrible. De temperatuur op aarde stijgt. Dat begint ergens halverwege de vorige eeuw. Vooral op het noordelijk halfrond zie je dat de laatste jaren de opwarming snel gaat. En dan met name in het Noordpoolgebied. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Does it, does it keep you awake at night? For example, the glaciers, the Arctic, melting. It does. And it's not just, it's not just the, the glaciers melting, it's not just the sea ice being lost, it's some of the other effects which we don't talk about. So, like? Well, the changes in the, in the, in the temperature in the, in the Earth are going to cause changes in the rate at which Methane, for example, is released from wetlands and indeed the permafrost. Methane itself is responsible for about a third of warming, certainly over the last 10 years. It's a very dilute greenhouse gas, but it's incredibly potent. And I'm worried that the changes in the temperatures that we are seeing will cause further release of, green, of methane at rates which we are unable to currently accurately predict. Als de temperatuur op aarde verder stijgt en er komt daardoor nog meer methaan vrij, komt de opwarming in een stroomversnelling terecht. Er is geen tijd te verliezen. So, this is the Center for Climate Repair and in particular this is our seawater lab. Okay. So, I don't see seawater. Well, we're in the middle of Cambridge, so we're quite away from the ocean. So this is as close as it gets to seawater. What we're trying to do here is to do experiments to figure out whether we can generate droplets of seawater of the right size to feed clouds and make them brighter. So the first... Wait, wait, wait. Make them brighter? Why? Well, the reason why we want to make clouds brighter over the ocean is that brighter clouds do a better job at reflecting some of the sun's radiation. Um, this, this thing that we're doing that sounds slightly sci-fi, um, and it's important... Slightly? For, very much Very, sci -fi. very much so. <laughs> but it's important for us to communicate that. Um, and so this is, demo here is actually a way for, for us to communicate what we're trying to do um, in, a, in a very, very small scale. Okay. So um, here we have a glass tank full of just plain old water. And what we've done is we split it into two equal sizes to simulate an Arctic environment. So hence we have uh, this, ah, the, this polar the bear. So it, it, do, yeah. do you mind placing one there? I'll of place course. one here. So I'll just put it right there. Um, this is for kids after all, so it should be a little yeah. fun. Yeah, of course. Um, but the, the major difference is on this side is we have something called an ultrasonic atomizer, which is producing droplets on the order of two micron. What happens now? 
Well, so right now we have this atomizer slowly uh, creating a haze. And so we have these two heat lamps to, to simulate the sun. So when we turn them both on, one thing we can notice is, is the one without the haze is, is clear, um, which means there's nothing blocking the, the, the heating rays from the sun. Whereas the, the fog here appears white because it's scattering that light. And after a few moments, we can actually measure the difference in surface temperature from this styrofoam to that styrofoam. So we have this laser thermometer. If you'd like to, to just point and click, yep. um, and we can measure there. So uh, just point on the surface there. 28.9, almost 29 degrees. OK, and if you'd like to point right down into the center there. OK, I'll just point it at the eyes. 23, so that's a lot cooler. Mm -hmm. 24 in the end. In het Center for Climate Repair onderzoeken ze hoe wolken witter gemaakt kunnen worden... met het doel om de aarde minder snel op te warmen. Hoe meer reflectie om de zon tegen te houden, hoe beter. Zou dit echt een oplossing kunnen zijn voor het klimaatprobleem? Binnen de wetenschap is verdeeldheid. Hoogleraar Milieubeleid Arti Gupta heeft samen met honderden wetenschappers... uit de hele wereld een brandbrief geschreven met een oproep dit soort vormen van climate engineering nooit te gaan gebruiken. Wat we zien is bijvoorbeeld planes flying around the globe, yeah. uh, making clouds. You're yeah. talking about a lot of uncertainties. What do we need to think about? We're talking about multi-generational, large-scale intervention, which would be akin to, you know, one and a half Pinatubo explosion uh, every, every year or something, and hundreds of aircraft flying. So the question also becomes whether there are a lot of un uncertainties, ecological and climate system uncertainties. Like what, for example? Well, the climate uncertainties are because we just, we simply don't know what, what this kind of injection of sulfate, aerosols, reflective particles would do to precipitation patterns to the ozone layer, to food systems. You know, we talk about tipping points around climate change, where, but we just simply don't know. Een ander ambitieus idee waarover nagedacht wordt, is om de zon af te schermen in de ruimte. What do you think of this solar shield? Yeah, I think, I mean, the these ideas are out there and uh, it sounds like science fiction and expensive unrealizable or just a distraction you are also saying don't even re start researching it why well because research that leads to technology development will A, not be able to tell us what we really need to know about the unknowable impacts at the same time It, go, it leads us down a path where once a technology exists and it has been developed, it will be deployed. And this is what history tells us. Once a technology is developed, it will be deployed and the scientists who developed it will not be asked for their view and their opinion about whether something, I mean, the history of the atomic bomb tells us that. So Arti Gupta is saying, don't even do research on this yep. subject. Don't even go there. Well, I mean, what we need to do is to further our knowledge in this area. And it might, in fact, help uh, clarify our thinking as to whether this is a, something that we really should be doing to buy us more time. It may also, it may also show us that It's impractical, it uh, costs too much energy, uh, it's never going to work. And we should know about this too, in other words, to get it off the table. But this uh, weak uh, knowledge base that we have at the moment is something that we need to address. And that's what we're doing here at the university. And so kijken Sean and his onderzoekers how they het perfecte zeewaterdruppeltje moeten maken, zodat wolken witter worden. 
The research in this laboratory is in large part aimed at figuring out whether we can generate droplets of seawater and generate those in a reasonably energy efficient way um, and in a robust way so that the droplets that we generate, and these are just literally droplets of seawater, like, it's a bit like sea spray, when those droplets evaporate, they will leave behind crystals of sodium chloride because that's obviously what's in seawater. Those crystals will then get convected up into the Earth's uh, atmosphere about a kilometre high and they act as the sites onto which water vapour will then latch onto, condense and form water droplets. The research here is all about figuring out whether we can get those salt crystals to be of the right size, which backtracking means can we generate sea spray of the right sized water droplets. So you're testing your theory. We are testing our theory. So Edmund, would you like to explain the various bits of this process? Yep, so we've got uh, water being pressurised coming in through here and being pumped down this uh, narrow pipe here and through these, this is a series of heater blocks and it makes its way down to some nozzles over there by which point it's reached this superheated temperature, 150, 200 degrees and everything over at that end is the detection side of the experiment. Sean I, I, and Edmund, I, I do not want to... Um be rude, but it does look a little bit Mr. Beanerish. It does. It does. <laughs> it's not um, very high tech. Well, what I expected. I'm sorry. No, it's. But that's that. That is one of the the key features of this. Is that the underlying principles that we are looking at to figure out whether we can use this um, idea to generate droplets of the, of the right size range are actually quite simple, but it just hasn't been done using salt water. And I really like Edmund's uh, design here, is that the volume of water that at any time that you've got under pressure and at a very high temperature. What I'll show you is how you can switch between different nozzles while the, while the spray is running. And in that way, I can see the effect of, uh, of different nozzles. I can measure the different effect of each, so. Ah, I see something happening there. Yeah, so we've got the heated water reaching high temperature here, coming out of the nozzle over here, and the spray being measured over down that way. And I can, I can use these, uh, this manifold to switch between different, between different nozzles. There so this is a big one and this is a smaller one? Uh, that one is, yeah, you're right, that one is larger than this one, yeah. So how do you measure the effect of each one of these nozzles? I can show you on the other side when it's a bit quieter. Okay, yeah. So you have the particles being drawn up out of the ducting by this probe down here. It gets split between two particle detectors, this one which measures the smallest particles and another one which measures the larger ones, and this will tell you what size they are. En dit alles om een zeewaterdruppeltje te krijgen van de perfecte grootte om het uiteindelijke doel te bereiken. Wittere wolken om zonlicht te reflecteren. Do you believe in marine cloud brightening? Do I believe in marine yeah. cloud brightening? I know that it works, whether it's practically feasible. That's really what we're here to discover. People are already having a go at at least testing the generation of sea spray um, in the field. And we're collaborating with a team down at Southern Cross University in Australia. So over the Great Barrier Reef, uh, they have a very particular problem of um, bleaching of the coral. Koraalriffen zijn extreem gevoelig voor het steeds warmer wordende zeewater. Een uitgelezen plek dus om op kleine schaal te experimenteren met het witter maken van wolken. Zo hopen onderzoekers het koraalrif daar te beschermen tegen de hitte van de zon. What are the results? Is it working? Uh, we're still waiting for the formal presentation of the, exper of the data that they've collected. But yes, we can see that the, the droplets have been generated. They do loft up, so they do get convected up um, after a certain distance away from the vessel. So all of these physical characteristics, phenomena that are predicted through modelling, 
at the moment appear to be sort of manifest in some of the observations that we've made, but it's still very early stage. This is happening right now at the yeah. Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, if, they are, if, if the idea is to have very localized, you know, seasonal interventions and to realize a local impact, say in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, that's a different type of challenge. But if, if there has to be a global scale impact of, of a technique like marine cloud brightening, then, we sim then there are still many uncertainties about that. Those who think this is the way, this is at least something that should be kept on the table, they talk about it as a temporary solution to buy time till we do what we need to do. But it's been 30, 40 years and we've known what we need to do. Het is dus bekend wat er moet gebeuren. Minder broeikassen uitstoten. Maar het gaat langzaam. In het Klimaatakkoord van 2019 is besloten dat in 2030 nog maar de helft uitgestoten mag worden. En in 2050 vrijwel niks meer. Er is dus nog heel wat te doen. Our concern is the very suggestion that we have something out there, a sort of get us out of jail free card. It distracts us, it delays what we need to do, and that delay will make the climate crisis and climate impacts much worse. And so it's, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Dit morele bezwaar is iets wat Sean ook bezighoudt. If climate change just continues to unfold as drastically as it is, I could get accused in 20 years time by my children saying, well, Sean, why didn't you try and find an alternative pathway of at least staving off the worst effects of climate change to a so that we can protect parts of our ecosystem and buy us more time to get greenhouse gas emissions down and greenhouse gas levels down. And I've reflected long and hard on that. And is it a dilemma for you as it well? It is, it is. It really is a dilemma. So I've got a moral hazard on one side, but I also feel we have a moral duty to further knowledge in this area. And I don't know how to balance these two. Voor Artie is het simpel. We moeten ons niet laten afleiden van wat ons te doen staat. If we had no other alternative on the table and the only thing that could get us out of an accelerating climate crisis was to do what we know we need to do, which is slash emissions, phase out of fossil fuels, etc., then that's where we would have to put all our attention, resources, etc. Do you want it to be done? Uh, now, I would like it not to be done. Um, the reason why I would like it not to be done is that we've got everything else sorted out and there is no need. And we won't need this technology. And you will be relieved. And I will be the happiest man on earth.